bit about uh, the organization and the program, but for your information, there are some sheets in the back there at the uh, table uh, having some quick facts about the PHC. And there's also a sheet they'd like you to fill out and send in to them. It gives you a chance to grade the speaker. And uh, so uh, we have an excellent speaker tonight, so make sure you um, fill out the form and send it in. The answer is excellent. <laughs> uh, I've heard him before. I heard him this afternoon, and I heard him once before at the David Library of the American Revolution in uh, Washington Crossing. So um, I'd say let's, uh, without further ado, let's have Mr. Paul Newman, Dr. Paul Newman. Thanks, Doc. Good evening. How are you all tonight? <clears throat> good evening. There you go. All right, you're alive. Very good. Uh, let's see if I can pull that off of there. And there we go. He goes on back there. Actually, it would be preferable if you would. There we go. Yeah, because they fine up here and that way if anyone needs to get out they can see. The title of my talk tonight listed in the catalog is Americans Will Always Fight for Liberty, the poster art of World War II. And so I start with this image that uh, from which I draw my title, Americans Will Always Fight for Liberty. And there are many reasons uh, that I use this image for my, my very first. Um, first of which, is that this is a, well, there goes my cough drop. This is a prime example of the kinds of poster work and propaganda that I'll be showing to you this evening. And I do use the term propaganda, which uh, if we're going to develop a working definition for it, excuse my cough drop, but uh, without it, I don't think I'll be able to finish. Um, if we're going to make a using uh, working definition of propaganda, it would be the manipulation or the government manipulation of information to mobilize bias, um, to produce a prejudice bias on a part of your subjects. And of course, that's what the Office for War Information was attempting to do throughout the entire World War. They had taken the mantle in fighting the propaganda war from an earlier machine, from the First World War, called the Office of Public Information. Um, and so the Second and the First World War were both events in which our government realized that the front lines were not just on lines of battle, uh, but were in the, the battle over ideas and how to frame our participation in the war. But more importantly, in this case, what we're going to see tonight, how to set each individual American citizen in their lives within the context of this great event and to have each individual American citizen directly identify with the success and or the failure of the context of this great event, the Second World War. Um, and so, what I'm going to show you tonight are dozens, about 60 in all, images of poster art from the Second World War. There were thousands of posters created, so you're just going to see a tiny little slice. But I'm going to try to represent the four major areas that the OWI and other government organizations, the four ideas that they were trying to sell the American public on. First, just like this image, to sell you on the idea that you should enlist and fight in this war. Second, that you should, if staying home, should work as hard as you possibly could, either in war industry or in other sectors of the economy that needed your labor to win the war. Third, you should, if possible, buy war bonds, lend your money to the United States government to fight the war and win the war. And fourth, you should conserve all vital resources that were necessary you know, for the federal government to uh, fight and win this war uh, and on their own front lines and for other nations as well. So those four things are going to be instructed um, by, or the federal government will instruct the American people on how to do those things through these kinds of images. So that's one reason I begin with this image because it's a classic piece of propaganda. Um, the slogan here, Americans will always fight for liberty. Well, that might have been true for the American Revolutionary troops, these Continentals. Uh, it certainly was. And it's certainly true for these men in 1943 who were fighting against Nazi totalitarianism and Italian fascism and Japanese imperialism. Certainly it is. 
But it, the term always, well, we always hadn't fought for liberty. You know, and, and many Americans know this. You know, in 1846, we didn't fight for liberty. We were fighting for land in the Southwest. That's what we were fighting in the Mexican War. Not necessarily always for liberty. But the propaganda campaign was to convince us that we had always fought for liberty. Let's forget some of our blemishes and the things that we don't, don't necessarily fit with uh, you know, this theme and stick with the connection between revolutionary soldiers and uh, their struggle for liberty <coughs> and the GIs of the 1940s and their struggles. So uh, it's, it's classic propaganda in that it, it whitewashes some uh, things, but it's not completely untrue. You know, there are elements of truth that are sewn together here. Well, so that's one issue. Another issue in this image, the reason I like to use it, is because it reveals a tension within the propaganda machine itself, within the Office for War Information. And the year that it was created is telling. This comes from 1943 from the OWI. Early in the war, uh, especially in uh, 1941 and 1942, and in the very early 43, uh, the OWI and other government organizations uh, or government departments, Treasury Department, Labor Department, Commerce, um, all of agriculture, all of the departments that were uh, putting forth their energy to creating posters to persuade Americans of various ideas, uh, their artists were, uh, had been employed through the WPA Federal Artists Project. And they were truly artists uh, who were unemployed during the Great Depression and who found work with the WPA. And their artwork uh, was uh, very symbolic and drew upon your emotions. It asked you as the viewer to interpret the piece yourself, uh, to come to your, con or come to your own conclusion, uh, believing that persuading you through emotion and symbolism to come to reach the same conclusion that the artist had by yourself was definitely the best way to win someone over to your point of view, rather than beating them over the head with slogans and, and a hard sell. Well, that um, type of approach to propaganda was fine in 1942 when emotions ran high already and support from the, for the war in 1942, its first year, was full tilt. But by 1943, it became painfully obvious that we were far from opening a second front in Europe, and that the war was going to take a lot longer than some of our experts uh, had believed it would take, uh, both in Europe and in the Pacific. And the possibility might be that this would drag on for years. And sooner or later, the rage militaire would begin to ebb. And so in 1943, the Office for War Information uh, began to phase out a lot of their artists, and they began to hire men who really were experts at selling people ideas and products. They hired men from Madison Avenue, advertising executives, to come into the OWI and to change the way that information was spread. And you can see the tension or see that transition in this image. This is artwork that was left over from uh, the early days of the OWI. The GIs marching past the Continental Soldiers. And the slogan here and the dates at the top didn't exist. The artist would simply put out this image and allow the American young man, citizen, to look at this image and realize what's going on. That these are GIs from the present day in the 1940s marching past Continental soldiers who uh, are standing in a blanket of snow with no shoes. Of course, who are they? They're Continentals who are at Valley Forge, you know, not too far from here. And that they would understand that these men marching past all are facing the same sacrifices and are fighting for the same thing. Liberty in the American Revolution, liberty in the world in the 1940s. But as the new ad executives come in, they came in and they looked at images like this and I thought, oh my goodness, this belongs in a museum, not on a street corner. Uh, you can't expect American citizens to be able to understand you know, all of the intricate symbolism and to really know their history. Um, and besides, these are guys who have been uh, selling people vacuum cleaners and toasters and radios and uh, automobiles and what have you. And the schools of advertising in the 1920s and the 1930s was you had to tell the consumer exactly what you wanted them to know and believe and exactly what you wanted them, what you wanted them to buy uh, and how they should behave. And so you began to see 
some of these images in 1943 that were leftover artwork with these kinds of labels tagged onto them. So explaining for you what's going on here. Americans will always fight for liberty. It's kind of sad uh, in a way because some of the earlier artwork really was beautiful. And I'm going to show you some of it tonight, um, uh, pieces that were done by Norman Rockwell and so forth, that the ODWI began in 1943 and 44 to turn down and to push away, uh, going with much simpler, um, uh, much more direct styles of advertising um, that artistically were much less pleasing than some of the stuff from earlier in the war. So that's another reason why I use this image, because I'm going to show you that over and over again tonight, how the changes took place. Another reason <clears throat> to use this image is that um, I like this picture. I look at this picture, and I can relate with these guys as historical subjects, actually, a lot easier I, than I can with these guys. I, I'm not a scholar um, who is concentrated on the Second World War. That's not my area of expertise. My area of expertise is the Revolutionary War period. Um, and uh, I've only come to be interested in and to be, if I am knowledgeable at all, in the Second World War indirectly through the Revolutionary War. I know this sounds kind of weird, but I'm going to go ahead and explain it for you. You see, when I was little, my first connection with history was in 1976 when I was in second grade. And it was the bicentennial of the United States. And everything we did in school that year was connected in one way, shape, or form to the bicentennial. Everything. You know, art projects, history projects, of course, reading, everything was connected. Even math was connected to the bicentennial. And I'd come home every day from school as we were preparing to celebrate the bicentennial and bring all these assignments home. And my mother supplemented my education <clears throat> in revolutionary history because uh, in the decade before the bicentennial, she had been uh, researching her genealogy, um, putting together the family tree, tracing her roots back to the revolutionary period and beyond. And whenever I came home talking about what we'd studied that day about the bicentennial, she would relate to me that, oh, yes, right, you, you learned about George Washington. That's fine. But uh, your great, 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 great grandfather was Samuel Wade Magruder, a general in the Maryland militia during the Revolutionary War. Wow, that's something else. And everywhere we would drive, I remember that year, we'd go around you know, the county that I grew up in, the town I grew up in. See that land over there? See that shopping mall? That was Samuel Wade Magruder's farm. Yeah, you see that strip mall over that way, right? That was another piece of his land he owned. Ooh, see that bank right over there? You know, that bank building, that old house, that was the house that he bought and lived in, you know, during the Revolution and afterwards. And so I was just inundated with this. But it was a great thing for me as a kid because when I went back into school the next day and we started talking about Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and Molly Pitcher and all of these figures from the Revolution, I had someone. I had Samuel Wade Magruder. I didn't know who this guy really was, you know, but my mother was trying to educate me about him. And he was part of my family. And it was a connection for me, a very personal connection to the American Revolution. And so I started studying this a little harder than my other classmates and trying to understand the world that Samuel Wade Magruder had lived in, to understand my family a little better and understand myself a little better. A lot for an eight-year-old, right? Um, but it was a great thing. I developed a sense of memory about an event that I'd never witnessed because I had a personal connection to it. And that's what's important about the images that I'm going to show you here tonight. Because uh, more and more people now, <laughs> on a daily basis, are being born uh, who have no memory of the Second World War and have no personal connection to it. Uh, and that's something that can be rather easily changed. So let me give you a last reason that I use this image. Uh, I have a connection to those guys on the left, which connects me to history. But the guys on the right here, I have a connection to as well. That's my grandfather, my father's father, Robert Roy Newman. Um, Roy Newman was my age when Pearl Harbor was bombed, 33 years old. He had four children. Three children were born during the Great Depression. He spent the Depression um, wandering away from his family, finding work, sending home checks, coming back home, leaving home again, working on a WPA project here, civilian conservation corps there, that kind of thing, just trying to 
keep his family alive and fed and clothed and housed. And so he spent most of the 30s away from his family. And in 1940, uh, war had just broken out in Europe in September of 39. And by 1940, the Virginia National Guard began a recruiting drive to get people to join the Guard and to you know, bolster our, well, we, don't have, we didn't have reserves then, but the idea was reserve forces. And so he took uh, a position with the Virginia National Guard at 32 years of age, uh, hoping that a war wouldn't break out, and betting against it, but taking the paycheck at the same time. And that paycheck allowed him to go back home to Petersburg, Virginia, and to live with his family, uh, and really live as a family unit for the first time. During the course of that year, my grandmother became pregnant once more with my father, born on uh, September 21st, 1941. And the whole family was together for the first time in, in most of a decade. And then, of course, on the 7th of December, the inevitable happened. The Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. By the 7th of January, my grandfather was away from Petersburg again. He'd be away for four years. Um, his trip back to Petersburg, Virginia, would take him first through Operation Torch in North Africa, and then an invasion into Sicily, and then into Italy, then up through the Italian mountains, the Alps, and then east to the Balkans. And that's where he was when the war ended in Europe. Finally then, reshipped back out across the Atlantic, across the country to San Francisco, where he was being mobilized for part of the ground invasion uh, of uh, Japan. He was in the infantry. Um, likely would not have lived uh, had it not been for uh, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Well, anyway, he's in San Francisco when the bombs are dropped, ending the war in Japan. And uh, he was uh, discharged on the uh, day after Labor Day, he told me. Um, and uh, was told that uh, he could stay in San Francisco and wait a few weeks uh, for transportation back home, or he could find his own way. Well, he'd been away from home for most of a decade and a half by this point. And the last thing he wanted to do was wait any longer. So he had his uh, uniform cleaned and pressed, uh, threw everything in his bag, and stuck out his thumb and hitchhiked his way from San Francisco to Petersburg, Virginia. Took him a couple of weeks. Um, didn't have to stop very much. Uh, whenever he had his uniform on, got a ride right away. But it took some time. It's in the age before superhighways. And he made it home on the 21st of September, 1945. And he walked into the door of his home, uh, into the middle of his four-year-old son's, my father's, fourth birthday party. There were uh, dozens of cousins, brothers and sisters, everyone there. And here comes my grandfather walking in. Uh, hadn't had a shave for a few days. He was about 25 pounds leaner than when he left a few years before. Uh, and, and very much a, a much different looking man in four years than my father's older brother and sisters remembered. They flocked. They flocked to him. Daddy, Daddy. Uh, my grandmother, of course, flocked to him as well. But my father sat at the table behind his birthday cake with his hat on, terrified. 
I can turn it off. Are done of productivity it was something that America, the American people weren't, you know, didn't necessarily understand it, uh, in 1941. Uh, but they would come to understand it through the Office of War Information, through a barrage uh, of, of posters and other types of information management. The war was one that was going to be one that would have to be fought on the Atlantic and the Pacific and every other ocean on the planet, on every continent, on various fronts all at once. And it was one that our soldiers were going to have to fight on all of these places. And if that wasn't enough, it was also more that we had to produce materials for all of our other allies to fight on even other fronts in other locations, like the British, the French, and probably most importantly, the Russians. All kinds of materials, guns, ammunition, tanks, airplanes, clothing, boots, shoes, food, wheat, all of these things would be absolutely necessary to support and supply our allies at the same time that we're supplying ourselves. And the production that would be necessary to do this would be unprecedented in human history by many, many, many fold. And so the U.S. government understood this in 1941, and they realized that the only way to win the war was to convince the American people of the exact same thing, that only full 100% productivity would enable us to win this war. And so it set out on a poster campaign and an information campaign, um, just like this, like this image from 1942 from the National Association of Manufacturers. Defend American freedom. It's everybody's job. Showing Uncle Sam taking off his red, white, and blue cap and trading it in for the blue cap of the blue collar worker. And you'd see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these posters. They'll be the most popular and the most uh, in terms of number. Well, there are a number of different kinds of posters within this campaign, getting people to work and work towards full productivity. One of the first that I want to call your attention to were posters like these. No time to let loose. It's a fight to the finish. And it shows the arm here with the word American worker strangling the enemy. <sighs> Bringing a war of massive devastation to peoples uh, is a hard thing to manage if you're a general and your troops to carry out orders uh, to kill large groups and large numbers of people. Uh, we have boot camp uh, and training camps that we put people through for weeks, uh, if not months at a time, to train them to be, act like machines and to deny their, their human impulses uh, towards saving life and to redirect them in an opposite direction, to dehumanize the enemy. If you can't dehumanize your enemy, you can't face your enemy and kill your enemy. It's impossible. Well. It's just as true, that the government believed, for the people who were manufacturing the ammunition and the weapons as it is for the people who were using those weapons. And they would have to come to dehumanize the enemy as well in their own minds if you're you know, working in a factory or plant that is producing weapons that would be used to destroy massive amounts of people. And of course, World War II would be that kind of war. We had long since discovered in our history that tactical warfare was not enough. We learned that in the American Civil War. We began to practice strategic warfare, where we targeted our enemy's capability to make war against us by it targeting their manufacturers and their transportation systems and their centers of population and workers. You know, Sherman, Grant learned that in 1864. Of course, World War I was one massive strategic war in which millions uh, of combatants and non-combatants alike perished. And World War II would be the same. And the government knew that at the outset, and it knew it had to prepare its workers for that eventuality. So much like uh, 
armed service personnel are trained to dehumanize an enemy in their own eyes, the US government through the OWI began to do the same thing for its workers. And how do they do it here? Well, they show the army of the American worker in the hand strangling the enemy. Who is the enemy? Well, is this a German? An Italian? No, it's Japanese. How do we know this is a Japanese person? Because they use racial stereotypes to immediately identify. Well, Japanese people can't see, they have little squinty eyes. So you put eyeglasses on them, but also you're using a snake. This idea that the Japanese are small, they're low, um, they're, uh, they're sneaky and treacherous, those kinds of ideas. Uh, we tag them with names instead of referring to them as Nipponese, we call them Nips, or instead of Japanese, they call them Japs. You know, all of these were ways to, you know, to dehumanize the enemy. And why the image of a snake? Well, because of Pearl Harbor. It was a sneak attack. It was a snake in the grass. They snuck cowardly across the Pacific Ocean in their huge flotilla uh, and pounced upon an unsuspecting population at Pearl Harbor, uh, killing uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people and destroying uh, a good part of our Navy, Navy in the offing in the Pacific. Well, um, it's kind of interesting, the, the whole sneak attack thing. I, I usually, when I talk to my students about it, and how we use that in propaganda during the Second World War, I always say to them, well, of course it was a sneak attack. You know, I mean, when you start a war, <laughs> you usually sneak up on the other person. Um, you don't make a phone call and tell them that you'll be there bombing at 8.15 and to be ready for you. Of course it's a sneak attack. And so that's one thing. And then the second thing is, is that it really, to our government, wasn't, didn't come as a huge surprise. Um, because our Navy had been engaging in operations in the Pacific with the Japanese since September of 1941. Uh, this isn't a huge surprise to our government. It's a very much of a surprise to a lot of American people because they hadn't been let in on that. Um, what they had been told about Japanese-American relations was that, well, the Japanese had sent a delegation to Washington, D.C., and there was a peaceful mission going on, and that uh, talks were in the works to prevent a war in the Pacific. Um, but this was the management of information. You didn't need to know that our naval personnel were already engaging the Japanese in the Pacific and had been doing so for four months. And so when, the, uh, when Pearl Harbor was bombed on December 7th, for a lot of Americans, this was news to them. And it had a tremendous effect, bringing people immediately uh, from a position where just a few months before, uh, there was still a sizable minority, uh, or actually a majority of Americans who opposed entering either a Pacific or a European war um, the next morning, just about everyone was ready to go. But this notion that uh, it was a sneak attack leads to uh, images like this one, you know, dehumanizing them by making them a snake. And these kinds of images have their effect. People respond to them. They're able to produce for the war effort. They're able to uh, join the war effort itself. Uh, but it has another effect as well, uh, a boomerang effect going in another direction. <clears throat> in January of 1942, just days after he signed an executive order that created the Fair Employment Practices Commission, probably one of his most democratic steps in office by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, days after he signed the FEPC order that would demand that all defense contractors with the federal government that they not discriminate against people on the basis of race, ethnicity, or gender. Days after that, Eleanor right. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066 that called for the internment of all Americans of Japanese descent, whether they were recent immigrants, children of immigrants, grandchildren of immigrants, or great-grandchildren of immigrants. And within months, more than 100,000 Japanese Americans, some of whom, whose great-grandparents had immigrated to this country in 1849 during the California Gold Rush, almost 100 years before, were relieved of their own property, had their bank accounts liquida liquidated, and were concentrated into what were first called reconcentration camps, but when that word became uh, a little too tied to things that were going on in Germany, renamed internment camps, uh, thousands of miles away from their homes, away from friends, families to split up, all of those sorts of things. A travesty and a tragedy uh, of American liberty 
that was going on, of course, while we were fighting a war to secure liberty. And not so coincidentally is something I just want to point out at this point, something that very few people know, that the most highly decorated regiment in the United States Army during the Second World War was the US 442nd, a regiment made up of Japanese American soldiers. Incredible, right? You know, facing their families, facing internment on the home front are the most highly decorated on the war front. Incredible story. Well, anyway, these people would suffer here due in, in large part to this propaganda campaign. Um, it, it, it worked a little too well in a lot of ways. Uh, and um, uh, it's a lesson that we should never forget. And I think it is a lesson that we've learned. Um, in the days since the uh, terrorist attack of the 11th of September, my first concern immediately, one of my first worries, I mean, after all of the, the obvious ones, um, was what kind of reaction we would have to people in this country who were Islamic or people who are of Arab descent, you know, thinking immediately about things like this in our past. And I thought immediately of, of friends of mine. I have a number of friends that I made back in the 1980s when I was in college and I was delivering pizza. And they were young men who had um, fled from the Iranian army of, of uh, the uh, Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, they, they fled from that army because they didn't want to fight with Khomeini and they didn't want to fight against the Iraqis. 